All right, good morning and welcome to the Georgia College Bobcats for Business live stream today. It is called Too Much Togetherness and we are so excited to have a proud alumna join us today. Her name is Celeste Orr and Celeste Orr owns a company that offers workshops, groups, uh, books and coaching for moms who dream of having deeper connections at home and living a life full of big family adventures and Celeste and her family have certainly done that. Uh, Celeste recently just published a book, recently as in last month. It is entitled to, uh, in Togetherness Redefined, Finding a Different Kind of Family Togetherness. It's available on Amazon, and we are so excited to have her join us today. We're going to talk about navigating homeschooling, hybrid learning, a phenomenon called world schooling, um, and basically learn how we can support our students in their current mode of learning, whether that's in person or hybrid or completely online and also how we can prepare to transition them to any other modes that might um, come their way. So Celeste, welcome, and what do you have for us today? Thank you so much, Kate. It is so good to be here, and I'm a very proud alumna of Georgia College um, and graduated in 2003 with a sociology degree, and then earlier this year finished up my MPA. So I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm so excited also because I get to talk to parents, which is my biggest passion these days. So I've been a homeschooling mom since 2009 when my first wild son um, hit preschool age and we didn't know really what to do with him. <laughs> so we tried homeschool and we had the help of actually a local um, curriculum writer in Twiggs County, Georgia, uh, Alpha Skills. They helped us get started in, in our homeschool journey and we've been homeschooling ever since we fell in love with it and uh, seven years ago we decided to sell our home in Milledgeville and move into a an Airstream travel trailer and we have seen 48 of the 50 United States since then so homeschooling and working remotely have been my life for yeah since 2009. <laughs> So you were I, certainly prepared for the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Okay. It's still been difficult, I'll say. So I, I wanted to, you know, jump right in and I have a few strategies that really have helped me deal with homeschooling and working remotely. And then also um, when the pandemic hit, it was difficult, you know, for all of us. So whether you are, you know, whether you've chosen traditional education or home school, whether you travel or you do some combination of both. Um, I think I have a few strategies, hopefully that will encourage you and help you. So I'm just gonna jump right in. Uh, when Kate sent me the question, I really just smiled a big, huge smile because that is the question on all of our minds. It, are we having too much togetherness? Like, is this really dangerous <laughs> for our kids, our marriage, um, their education, you know, ourselves personally? Like, is this okay? Or, or is what we're doing okay? Um, and so for the past 11 years of homeschooling, I've had that question in my mind every day. You know, every person who takes on something new, different, out of the box, um, they question themselves and I, I'm right there with you. So my answer though came immediately. I don't think we can ever have too much family togetherness. I know not everyone will agree and I'm really okay with that. I love dialogue about that, but I really believe in the power of parenthood. I have had the privilege of working with parents in all sorts of socioeconomic backgrounds, all sorts of places where they live um, internationally and in the U.S., Georgia and other states. And I really see a spark in every single parent when they really just love their child and they want what's best for them. So I believe in that spark and it's my passion to really do all I can to help every single parent um, give their child what they need. And a large part of that is believing that we can, you know. So a lot of times togetherness when it seems sticky or not really working, when school at home seems so difficult, really what we need to do is redefine togetherness, redefine what we're doing. And so I've got seven strategies. I'm not going to teach class, but I'm just going to share a little bit. So, um, so well, I'm taking notes. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I will have links for you guys afterwards. We'll be able to share some links. All of this is online. So if you want to take notes, that, that's, I mean, that's so cool. But if not, you know, you'll, you'll be able to read about it. So, okay. My first tip is relationships first. So you may be a teacher right now. You may be a cheerleader for your kids. You may be their homeschool helper, homework helper. But first of all, you're their parent. You're their mom, dad. You know, you are their grandparent. We may have some grandparents um, online today. And that's what you are first. So something I've learned over the past 11 years is kids are going to learn. You can't stop them. <laughs> you absolutely cannot stop them from learning. But relationships don't come automatically. That's what we have to be intentional about. And so a lot of that is going to take sacrifice to be someone who is a family loving person. It may take sacrificing some sleep. You know, I talk a lot about blowing up that schedule that we have, you know, in our mind, someone told us that the day begins at 8 a.m. and it ends at 5 p.m. But actually, I think the opposite is true. Your day can begin at 5 a.m. and end at 8 p.m. You know, I really can't tell you how many days I start working at 5 a.m. And then my kids are teenagers right now, so they don't wake up till, you know, nine or something. So I've worked four hours before they ever get up. And then sometimes we're still doing school, you know, at 8 p.m. So don't be afraid to make the sacrifices you need to make to make your relationship first. Um, so... I will say really quickly here too, sometimes that means like even in your other relationships. So, you know, even if you have friends who don't understand the time you need to be with your family, if you have something going on that really isn't helping you be a family first kind of person, let it go, you know, even as painful as it can be. Okay, so that was the first one. The second one is reading is our first priority. So, you know, when you find your flow, when you set your schedule and you get into your day, you know, of like working, schooling, helping, all of those things, something's going to need to fly out the window. <laughs> and Absolutely. all I can say is don't let it be reading. So when I know that my kids are, you know, picking up a book that they're so interested in, I know I've won, you know. Um, so research says that kids who read and are read to, they're the ones who are the most successful in college, in life. You know, those lifelong learners, those are the ones who are going to see success. So when you throw things out the window, don't, don't let it be reading. <laughs> um, all right, number three, foster curiosity above standards. So... I'm one of those homeschoolers who I'm a big fan of the core curriculum standards. I'm a big fan of, you know, testing our kids, making sure they're staying on level, whatever that level is. I'm a huge fan of teachers, and um, obviously I'm a, I'm a huge fan of regular education, right? Especially liberal arts education. So at the same time, though, I want my kids to be curious you know, so if they really hate something that we're studying, I'm going to help them get through that so that we can discover something they are curious about. So again, when they're picking up big books, when they're asking me to use the computer to research something, that's, that's a huge win, you know. So building lifelong learners, that's, that's a big thing. And it goes right into my fourth tip, which is keep your big picture in mind. So as these days like drone on and on and on, you know, the pandemic that will never end, the kids that, you know, go to school, come home again, <laughs> um, we may be in a situation where everyone is learning at home right now. Um, don't forget what your big picture is. So one of my biggest um, homeschool mentors says, you know, we all want our kids to be successful. We want them to get into college if they want to go. We want them to be those 36-year-olds who pay for an advanced degree themselves, you know, like I did, because I just wanted it. And um, it was so valuable to me. I want my kid to be a lifelong learner. But if they are the top of their class, you know, at any place and they hate their family, 
then something has gone awry, you know? So that's my first priority, you know, is building those relationships and even in their education that comes to play in there. So what are yours? You know, I just encourage every family to sit down and set aside your priorities and keep that big picture picture in mind. All right. Are you ready for number five? Am I talking too fast? No, that makes no, no, that makes perfect sense. And anyone watching, please feel free to submit any questions in the chat box. We'll uh, get to them at the end. But I'm ready for number five, Celeste. All right. So number five is don't be afraid to go outside of the box. So, you know, I know right now kids who have been in um, traditional school, they, when they're sent home, they have a certain Zoom class, right, that they have to plug into. They probably have some homework that has been assigned to them. So I just want to encourage any family, don't be afraid to go outside of that box. Definitely do what the teacher is asking you to do. Communicate with him or her. Um, you know, do everything that you're supposed to do. But don't let that be the, the end of their learning and education. Okay, so at the end of the day, some school days are great. Like we learn, we talk all day long, we have a great, um, just a great time together and we're learning something really cool. Some school days are horrible. There are tears. <laughs> <laughs> Mama didn't drink enough coffee, you know, all that right. kind of stuff. Um, some days people just wake up on the wrong side of the bed, okay? So when those days happen, I have two magic secrets that I pull out of my hat. One of them is board games. So board games and card games, they are magical for deep learning and they're also magical for deep relationships. So I think I mentioned I have one kid who has been outside of the box from day one <laughs> and I have another kid who is very energetic you know so sometimes in order to get them to settle down and focus on their math or you know do some spelling or whatever it is I have to pull out a board game that we really love and sit there and play it with them you know so I have to schedule my phone calls around that I have to push my emails you know to another part of the day but it is so worth it for deep learning and for deep um, relationship and I, I have a resource that will help um, there's a homeschool mom who does a lot of what she calls game schooling and I love her so much so I use her resources all the time and I have a link for that um, the second thing within that is audiobooks we start our homeschool day almost every single day and a lot of weekend mornings with an audiobook. We pull out our teapot, we make a pot of tea, we have a long breakfast. Um, I call that long luxurious breakfast over on my site and we talk about that a lot. But we start with an audiobook that everyone is interested in. So um, right now we're doing the um, mysterious the fourth or fifth book each book is like 12 hours long 11 or 12 hours long <laughs> and we just listen to a little bit a day but it starts our day off with everyone activated you know plugged into each other and engaged so those are those two magic things you know that you can keep in your back pocket all right number six are we ready for number six we, well, a quick question personally, board games, are there any specific ones that you feel are really great for, um, for learning specifically or which ones do, you, do your family members enjoy? Yeah, that has really evolved over the years. You know, when my kids were small, we of course started out with Candyland and we did a lot of discovery toys, which, mm -hmm. you know, when my kids were four and five, their curriculum basically consisted of discovery toys, which are some learning games, and then um, the alpha skills that I was telling you about reading together and asking questions and those kind of things. So we started there and one of my kids fell in love with board games and card games. So he'll research those on his own. And then I'll plug into, you know, that resource that I was telling you about. Right now, our favorites are Sith and Wingspan um, okay. and, and Dominion. We've probably spent 
you know, two or three hundred dollars on Dominion expansions <laughs> in our family. And it's like An investment. Birthday, right, right. Every birthday, you know, somebody wants a, a game that costs, you know, thirty to fifty dollars. So I'm like, well, I'm glad it's your birthday. Right. <laughs> yes. So, okay, number six. Mm -hmm. um, balance is actually a myth. It really is. You cannot balance all of this. It is a season of life. It's not going to last forever. Um, for some of us, that makes us pretty sad, you know, that our kids won't always be at home. But whatever, however you feel about it, it's not going to last forever. You cannot work eight hours a day and do homeschool four to five hours a day if you're not willing to really integrate those parts of your life. So recognizing that, you know, some days you're going to be a great employee and your homeschool may not be that great. You know, other days you are going to be really awesome in the kitchen with your kids. You know, you're going to be a great wife and mom and do all that domestic stuff, you know, that I'm uh, honestly horrible at, but <laughs> I'm still waiting on those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thankfully my husband cooks sometimes for me. So, um, but you know, other days you are really going to rock the whole helping with school, helping with homework, that kind of stuff. Um, so just recognize that we're all humans, you know, and that happens for everyone at work. That happens for every single teacher. Some days they have a great, you know, on point day and other days they don't. So um, just recognize that that happens for all of us. Trying to balance it all like little tiny plates, it's not going to work, you know. And your kids want you. They want you believing in yourself. They want to see you believing in them, you know. So if you're trying to do all of that balancing act, it's really not going to work. So give yourself some grace. And the last one is simplify. Whatever you're doing, make it as simple as you possibly can. Like shave off all of that extra stuff. So this is where those of us who have chosen to homeschool or unschool or world school our kids, we get so overwhelmed because everybody has a resource to share. You know, everybody has a way that it should be done or it can be done. So I get to reading that stuff and I feel horrible about myself. You know, we all do. But I think the key is to really, really simplify and to take what works for you and just put the rest aside or even just delete it from your email, you know, let it go. Um, and I have a resource for that too. It's a book called Simplicity Parenting. So if you tend to struggle in that area, like I do, you order too many books or you, you know, have too many games or whatever, I really recommend Simplicity Parenting. It, it has really changed the way that we do a lot of things. So that was it. Those were the seven tips. And overall, just a big encouragement for parents. You know, I believe that parents are really leading the way these days, and they have the potential to always do that, lead the way for their kids in life, in education, in everything. And, you know, we're in it together. So that's it. <laughs> Those are great points. Um, and we actually had a comment. It's refreshing to know that um, this daily grind, this stage won't last forever. And, and balance is a myth where we are all very human. Um, and I loved your point about Simplify. Uh, during COVID, I was astounded and happily so that there were so many resources that it quickly did become overwhelming. Um, so I, th I think you're dead on about finding what works for your children at that point. Um, so I invite anyone to uh, chat in any questions. I have a couple questions that, uh, that we would like to ask you. Okay, so say a child is in one particular mode of schooling. Say they are in the classroom with masks on today. Say next week they, are, uh, they have to go sent home full time. How do we transition our children to such a, um, a different mode of learning? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think keeping them in 
a, a schedule or, you know, whatever they enjoy and what they're used to, you know, if they really thrive on having a to-do list, okay, I do math at eight, I do reading at nine, I do science at 10. If they love that, if that gives them security, keep it keep it at home, you know, um, ask your, you know, for those of us who work at home, just communicate with your boss and ask them if they're willing to have that flexibility to allow you to schedule your meetings around what your kids need, you know, and my second tip would be, you know, beyond the schedule and the flow, um, and if your kid doesn't like that, you know, if they like to do things differently when they're at home than they do at school, do that. Just ask them, you know, no matter their age, I bet they have an opinion. <laughs> but my second, my second thing would be really to um, engage with them and make it fun. You know, we can't always put aside our work and just be there for school. But when we can, I think it, you know, something magical happens when we do that. I've found that 30 minutes of that kind of engagement will give me, you know, three hours of free time to work because they'll be engaged and they'll be able to go further without me there. That's a great point because um, I know some for so many of us working from home and teaching um, has had some, some wonderful moments and some very hard moments. And I know um, many of us have relied too much on screen time. So I suppose an alternative, well, in addition to screen time is, is try to go ahead and get in that core one-on-one -on -one time and then perhaps they're more likely to let you work. Um, do you have any other tips on what we can do? Say we are in a meeting that we, we've got to focus and um, our children are wanting our attention. What do we need to do to kind of help the, help make sure we're addressing the work that's needing to be done while also being empathetic to our children's needs? Yeah, um, you know that brings up something that has really given me a lot of peace lately is that knowing that every, this day and age, all of us have kids who really want to play video games. You know, I mean, most of us, I'll say, they want to be on screens. Um, in our family, we have always set pretty strict guidelines. They can't just do that when they want to, um, but they always push, they push, right? They always look for when you're in a meeting or when you're on a phone call and then they want to sneak it or like ask for your attention and they know you can't give it. So they, you know, use that as their screen time. So what I try to do is always get ahead of that. I always try to plan ahead and think of something that is such an exciting alternative for them that they're not thinking about their screens, you know? So again, it's back to that communication. We, you know, if I find them doing that, I say, listen, do we need to take some time off, you know, because it seems like it's really taking over your mind? Or are you okay playing it from six to eight every night? Or are you okay playing it from seven to eight every night? You know, what is it um, that's going on here? And then once they make that you know, we have that conversation, I say, okay, well, right now you can't do screens. So uh, would you like to do Legos or are you happy to research this topic or whatever? Again, minor teenagers, so they can research things. You know, what, what would you like to do? So I give them an alternative, A or B. I don't just say, all right, I'm busy, go play. <laughs> you know, that rarely turns out well, I'll say. That makes sense though, giving them a choice, letting them have some decision, some power in that decision making. Um, I have a couple questions from people watching right now and thank you both viewers for being with us this morning. Uh, we're really glad to have y'all on such an important topic. Uh, the first question is how much input do you give your child for the decision making about how they are schooled, especially now that there's many options for what school can look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I think every family is different on that, you know, and it really depends on um, your situation as far as your time, your finances. Um, it, it um, Honestly, it depends on where you are located. You know, can you move? Can you travel? Uh, we have used travel the past seven years as a huge part of our curriculum. But you know what? We always said to our kids, we're going to reassess this every year. 
and we're going to ask you, is this still working for you? Um, recently, and you know, the pandemic really didn't have anything to do with this, but recently we had that conversation with our kids and they were sort of on the fence. They were like, we've loved our traveling, but now we're older. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, so we do give them a lot of input, but they don't get to make the decision. So in our house, there are four votes um, and we recognize that as parents, we have a little bit more information than our kids do. At the same time, we want them to be respected and their voices heard. So um, right now there's a safety element to it. Uh, we always told our kids, you know, at whatever time that you want to start classes at the high school, at the middle school, at a community college, we want to make that happen for you. So we believe in that. We believe in that track of education and we're going to do everything we can. Um, but right now there is a safety you know, a safety measure. So I would say it really is a conversation. I try to give my kids a voice all day, every day, um, but it is a dialogue. It's no one in our house gets to make, you know, that one decision themselves. And yeah, that makes perfect sense. And um, the, the, the learning while you're traveling, I know many parents, we take our kids on vacation and we try to run by a museum or a national park. Uh, what are some tips for teaching while we're traveling? I mean, because traveling is fun. It can be a little stressful. So how do we in, in, immerse learning throughout? Yeah, yeah. Um, that has been such a learning journey for me to figure that out because when our kids were tiny um, and our youngest was born in Australia, we moved over there when our oldest was a baby um, for my husband to go to school and we when we came home, you know, and, and got back into life in Georgia, and then we realized we wanted to travel, but all of our family vacations were like, we were fighting over ridiculous things, you know, <laughs> like we were really, you know, like turn left or right and we're fighting about it. Okay, that cannot be full-time travel. We can't do that. Um, so it really is a different way to think about travel. Um, and museums you mentioned are a huge thing. Um, obviously right now they're not, but national parks have been our go-to. So I encourage um, on my site on togethernessredefined.com, I always talk about, you know, find what your family's thing is. And here are some ideas of what has worked for my family, what's worked for a lot of other traveling families we know. Um, but at the end of the day, you find what your thing is. If your thing is baseball, you might travel to different baseball games all over the country, you know, and you can learn about the history of each city while you go. There are a million different ways to educate our kids. Um, through travel and through experience, even without travel. But I will say for Georgia, for anyone listening from Georgia, we are a huge fan of the Georgia State Park System. They have been, you know, we spent our first year and a half of travel living and working in the Georgia State Park System. And they have amazing education programs just in their nature centers. Like you could spend, you know, ages just doing that within your home state. That's a great, great tip, um, especially when, you know, so many of us are trying to find economical decisions. And I think most state parks are free or, you know, very, um, you know, inex inexpensive options. Um, so we have a couple more minutes for questions. Uh, so last chance to type in a question. I have uh, one that I know of. Is Simplicity Parenting a book by Ken John Payne? Uh, okay, great. Uh, so we're going to post, uh, Celeste will post the link to her website, her book, the uh, Simplicity Parenting book. And this live stream is also going to be hosted on Bobcats for Business, such as bobcatsforbusiness.com. Um, so Celeste, is there any last takeaways that we need to go before we uh, try to hang in there during this parenting pandemic? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I will just mention that I did a podcast about the Simplicity Parenting movement. It really is more than a book. Um, so I did a podcast about that and I'll post that link. Um, also, you know, something I forgot to mention, which I can't believe I forgot it, but libraries are, you know, someone mm -hmm. said this and I've just taken it on. They are the treasure chest of every community. Your public library is free. 
you go there and, you know, right now, a lot of them across the country are closed, but they have, um, a lot of them have curbside pickup, you know, and you can order your books online and they will put them out there in a bag and you pick them up and bring them home. As someone who is trying to keep their kids busy and off the screen, <laughs> you know, without the library, mm -hmm. I really don't know how we would have survived. I mean, we cannot afford that many books, but they have so much more than just books. They have programs, they have free language um, learning, free, like a lot of them have mango where you can learn foreign language. And then they have a little state park pass that you can check out so you can go to those parks for free. Again, I don't know if it's available right now, but uh, like I said before, overall, I really, you know, I really feel called to encourage parents and to empower them, to let them know, you know, these are your kids and they love you. They're looking to you. They want you to be yourself. You know, they want you to show up for them and in whatever way you can. And when you mess up, you get to press that reset button and start over again. So that really is why I wrote a book called Togetherness Redefined. It has 52 togetherness tips in there for families because a lot of times all we need is just one tiny idea you know to change this hard day into a good one all we need is somebody to remind us oh we can roast marshmallows tonight or we can roast marshmallows right now you know so it has 52 of those tips and then you know I also started my own business and do um, classes and things because I want people to have that stuff all the time so I have a lot of resources and links and a, a fresh togetherness tip every Friday on my site for people so anybody who wants to keep the conversation going I'm here and and I'd love to well, I'm inspired I'm, I've got my notes I've got some things we're gonna do when the kids get home um, I really appreciate you being with us, Celeste. It's been a pleasure. Um, we definitely want to have you in the future. But please check out Bobcats for Business and Celeste's website and her resources. And we um, appreciate having y'all here today. And um, go forth and parent. Awesome. <laughs> Thank <Celeste>. you. <laughs> See ya.